This is Steve Laffey's Fixing America. And now, broadcasting live from the Fixing America Command Center in Fort Collins, Colorado, here is your host, Steve Laffey. Good afternoon, America. This is Stephen Laffey with Steve Laffey's Fixing America. Welcome to the inaugural broadcast of, of, the ish, of our show. We're glad you could join us today and be part of this journey. Uh, it's been a long time coming to be able to sit here in front of you all. And we're gonna, that's really the show today. How, how did we actually get here today to speak to you all uh, in a way that be conductive to solving problems? We're broadcasting here in live, high definition. And we'll do it again. <laughs> here we are again. Steve Laffey here broadcasting from the command center up in Fort Collins. And we're glad to get through the magic, magic of the internet. We're here. Broadcasting in 1080p, high definition. And we're going to have a show here that's going to be about n really nothing but fixing problems. By helping America's people, the people I've met all over this great country. And we've got a great show planned for you. We've got shows all this week for you. But let's go into what we're doing here today. And how we actually had to get here. But, you know, when you go, first of all, many of you people are now on LaffeyRadio.com. That's the place to go. You know, the home button there at LaffeyRadio.com is sort of the, the epicenter. We've got a lot of things planned on the website. You can, there's a lot of work went into the website. Uh, we've got a situation where we're going to have the Laffey Buzz, for example. We're going to be blogging to you about solutions. We're going to have the Laffey Minute. And, and the Laffey Minute is going to be uh, you know, everything you're kind of thinking that no one talks about. We're also going to have Fixing America Presents. We've already done one of them, and that won't come out every day, but that'll be something that will be a, a little bit longer, uh, something maybe about a solution for the banks that we've done on the website. You can see about J.P. Morgan. And we're also going to have a, a, a longer version, about once a month, where we really go in depth on topics. But consider yourself a charter member here. Uh, fixing America because it is, a, it is a nation that is broken. Both of our parties have, have really done us a disservice. I'm someone who's been in office as a Republican. I've run for the U.S. Senate. And, and we've got a situation now in America where we are near, we wouldn't have said this in 1979, but we're near a situation where the country as a great republic as the world's greatest superpower, our elected officials, and therefore us, have put everything at risk. You know, we're also on Facebook. We've got Facebook. Uh, we'd like you to like us at Laffey Radio on Facebook. Uh, or follow us on Twitter at Laffey Radio also. And bookmark the, the webpage, uh, LaffeyRadio.com. But most importantly, share this stuff. Share the, the blog. Share the Laffey Minutes. Share them with your friends. So many people are busy. They don't have time to go through three hours. They just need to know, what is the problem with our banks? What's going on with our budget deficits? And, and, and what we see in the, in the media today is we don't really see solutions. We see people attacking each other. We want to do a show here on a daily basis. That's why we're doing it for an hour to start. We want to get to solutions. Tomorrow we're going to be balancing the U.S. budget, something that hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, all of the broadcasts are going to be on-demand viewing, so if you can't watch it now, for example, and you turn in tomorrow at 4 o'clock, it'll be tomorrow's show will be playing over. Just go to the, the home page, go to uh, On Air Now, uh, look at Channel 1, and we're going to be archiving all of the shows, putting them up on YouTube so you can watch all the shows. You can go back and watch them. You can watch them over the weekend. Um, and we're producing, you know, specific solution series. The, the Fixing America Presents series will be a specific solution series that, uh, that we will just look at specific issues maybe once a week and take them on. Um, bookmark everything. And, and, and here's the real point. We've got to join together. We, the people of America, have to join together. We've got to unify the message 
we've got to change the nature of the debate. That may be the most important thing. We've really got to change the nature of the debate here. And it, and it combines with something you'll see on our website. And it goes back to when I was the mayor of Cranston. So many people think they're alone. I mean, right now, most Americans know there is a gigantic financial problem in Washington. There's issues of corruption. I mean, the, we know that the, the nation is not doing well. Seventy-some-odd percent of the people of America think the country is in the wrong direction. And yet when you turn on the TV or turn on the radio, it's generally someone shouting about somebody else. Here at LaffeyRadio.com, on the Steve Laffey's Fixing America show, we want to get beyond that for a while. We want to find the things we can unify ourselves about. And granted, we won't capture everybody here. There are some people who think that we can run deficits forever, have no concern about the future of the country, and they're just going to take what they can get. That's not the vast majority of people. And that's not how I came to do this show today. I came to it through a long series of events that started in my childhood and worked my way through even this year in, in entering politics for a short while in Colorado, where I live now. But yeah, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit. How did we get here? How did I get here? And for you who don't know me, you're tuning in for the first time. Uh, I'm from Cranston, Rhode Island. As I write in my book, Primer Mistake, I'm a son of a tool maker. My dad was a wonderful guy. We had five children, and there was a lot of issues in the, in the family. So I spent some part of my, uh, of my early childhood trying to, trying to fix my family. And I guess I became a, a serial fixer at one point. Uh, that's what I do. I tend to try to fix problems. Some I've succeeded in, some I haven't succeeded in. In high school, as president of the student council, I spent a lot of time trying to you know, fix some of the problems we had in the high school. Uh, went off to college, uh, Bowdoin College in, in Brunswick, Maine. And, uh, and tried to, became the president of student council there, tried to fix some of the endemic problems we had in that system. Mostly I was a kid without a lot of money, so I, I headed off after Harvard Business School uh, to, to Wall Street, mostly to Payne Weber and then to a company called Morgan Keegan. Um, but it was a situation that, you know, in, the, in Wall Street, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was still living a life that I really didn't see America. I saw it as a kid. I saw a family struggling. I come from sort of a lower middle class uh, family, Irish Catholic family. But on Wall Street, when I worked on Wall Street, I, not that I forgot about it, but I was just in the groove of like trading, yelling, screaming, talking on telephones, um, moving money around, which, which I was good at and I, and I liked a great deal. And so I was kind of into that life. Uh, and, I lo and I wanted to run a brokerage firm. I wanted to run an investment banking firm. I found myself... Uh, Heading off to Memphis, Tennessee, met a great man named Alan Morgan. Had a great firm called Morgan Keegan. Uh, and he had, had his name on the door, Morgan Keegan. He'd found it probably, oh, I guess, 21 years before I, before I showed up. And uh, I became his partner. And I learned an awful lot about fixing problems in the financial sector. That was my background, of course. Um, and I kept doing it. I kept doing it with Morgan Keegan. There was a time where... Um, I was in sales for a long time, and then the, the research department, for example, had a, had a real problem. Uh, they had never made the Wall Street Journal All-Star Survey. They had, a, had some turnover in the analyst, and at some point they came to me in end of 1995 and said, would you, t would you take over this division? It, it, it wasn't doing well. And research wasn't really at the firm held in any great esteem, as it should have been, because that was really the lifeblood of the firm. The firm was a sales firm. But really, the light bulb was getting people good ideas, you know? And, and the same thing we're talking about today, fixing problems without telling people accurately, as best you could, what stocks to buy and, and focusing on that and spending money on that. We couldn't really have a great firm. And so I was put in charge of that. And a year and a half later, we had sh we, we, I found a lot of solutions from the people I worked with, listening to people who worked in that division. I, uh, we turned it around. I mean... We ended up with a research department that at one point was ranked number one in the Wall Street Journal All-Star Survey for stock picking and, and did a good job for our clients. And we used that to really gather assets from, from clients because we had a good product that could make money. And so I went through my whole career there. I mean, I, I learned so much about, always they were financial problems generally, but they were human research pr problems. And I always felt that unlike the U.S. government today, um, it was better to be transparent. Better to go to people with a notepad. In fact, you'll see the show. All you really ever see is these notepads because I, I tend to 
take notes all day long from things that I can learn from people and then things I have to do, and then try to put them together. And, and in learning lessons from guys like uh, John Stokes, the vice chairman, about really just following the money, seeing where the money was going, finding out how to get to the root of problems. And one of the problems we have in politics today is that, simply put, for the most part, I mean, for the vast majority of our elected officials, they're not interested in getting to the crux of the problem. And they're not interested in tackling the biggest problem first. Because if we were interested in tackling the biggest problem first, you would see something about Social Security, Medicare, and national defense on the news every single day. You would hear about entitlement programs that are, that are basically bankrupting our country, have bankrupted our country, basically. We just hadn't told people where there's $200 trillion of unfunded liabilities that are the debt on our children. And we'd have conversations like we're going to have on this show between older people and younger people and asking older people and trying to figure out why. Why the greatest generation or the generation after the greatest generation? Why they, do they not know that the younger people can't possibly pay this debt back? Or do they know? And what about the young people? Why haven't they risen up? Do they, do they not see these simple solutions? Do they think that they're ever going to get a Social Security check now at, at the age of 23, 24, 28, 29? Do they think 30 years from now, at this rate, they are ever going to be able to have a real productive life like their grandparents did in this country? And what about our foreign policy? Do we ever really see a strategy, like an analysis of a strategy so that our country would remain the world's superpower? And why would we want that? These are things that don't get discussed. They don't get discussed at all. We don't discuss the, the rising power of China and how our trade relationship with China is something that is really destroying the infrastructure of America. And I want to talk to you about that in terms of how we got to the show and we'll get into this next segment about me traveling the country. Because I've been blessed to be able to just be on the ground, be the, be the, uh, the grassroots guy, be the crop duster, uh, and just meeting with people all over this great country and not just, you know, staying at, at Morgan Keegan. And to back up back to Morgan Keegan, I was there from 92 to 2001. And, yeah, we did a lot of different things. At, at one point... Uh, the trading desk had a huge problem. And, we, and for you don't understand, you've seen this on TV when you watch a movie, you see a downstairs or an upstairs trading floor, the downstairs is usually the, the, the New York Stock Exchange, and you'll see people yelling, screaming, walking around quickly. And I was more of an upstairs trader. Uh, someone in upstairs, we say, up, and it could be upstairs anywhere, but you're just not on Wall Street. And we had a, a giant trading problem. We ended up shorting stocks that we knew nothing about. So they came to me again and said, Steve, you used to be a trader. And I said, yeah. Can you take over the trading desk? And I did. And so we, we had to get to the very simple and direct uh, answers to the problems that we faced then. We had lost millions of dollars in the last month, and I had to restru restructure everything. And that helped me again to get, to get at looking at problems. And this was a severe problem, and it was a one that had to be handled immediately. You couldn't, you couldn't lose the kind of money we were losing every month and report that back to shareholders. Something had to change. And we had some great people on the desk, lady who ran the desk, great, wonderful people. So we restructured how we looked at it and how often we looked at it and, and what stocks we were trading. And lo and behold, the years went on. I don't know if we ever lost money any other month until I left the firm. And after that, we needed to fix all of equity capital markets. And equity capital markets has the investment banking side, it has the trading side, it has the sales side. So I got put in charge of that and eventually in charge of that, including um, – uh, the investment banking side, which was new to me. I had not been an investment banker. I had been a trader, a salesman, back to being a trader, a research director. So I had to call in other people and I had friends on Wall Street and say, listen, I've never been in charge of, of this part of uh, the business. And, um, and so that helped me too, calling on friends, calling and just constantly, you know, having all these things and having to make quick decisions helped us restructure the investment banking department. It went on to have good profits and so forth. And finally, I really thought that, you know, I'd like to be not – Alan Morgan was always in charge of the whole firm. He's the CEO and the founder and, 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 and probably the nicest guy I'd ever met. Um, and really was a guy who taught me more about management and fixing these problems and how to listen. Um, heck, I watched him fire people. They didn't even know they were getting fired. He had such a style about him. 
I mean, really, he, 45 min- minutes into the conversation, someone would be leaving the firm, but he always did it in the right way. His style of, and it was not my style, but I took a little bit from him and from John Stokes, who was a fiery guy. You thought you were Teddy Roosevelt. It had to be done right now, and it, was, and it had, couldn't wait till tomorrow. When you combine those two styles, I tried to always learn from them about how to fix these different problems and go back to them and, and, and sort things out. Before we went out and made these, made, we made major changes, whether it was in institutional sales and the trading desk and equity capital markets and so forth. And then it came along to, they put me in charge of being president and, and, and the chief operating officer, a position that, that the firm had never held. Um, and I didn't really know what, what to do as a chief operating officer, but I, I looked it up. I mean, I know from business school and so forth, but that was not a position that I really aspired to. And I spent months doing stuff that, that we really hadn't done at the firm forever, maybe ever, which was going through every single business line, like we have to do with America, but going through every single business line and saying, does this, this a good business line? What is the return on this? What are the long-term prospects of this? And about six months later, I had some great help from people who put this stuff together, and about six months later, I had come to the conclusion that the way to really fix Morgan Keegan and its awkward size, to quote the CFO, was it had to be sold. The guys who ran the firm were older and they didn't want to go through the pain of changing it, I didn't think, and I loved them. They were great guys and it would have been a five-year painful change. And so these, these talks that we went through finally convinced, I think, Alan to, to sell the firm. And then I got to run the transition team, which was another thing about learning how to, you know, talk about integrating all these different systems together between a $4 billion bank and a half a billion dollar revenue investment banking firm and how to fix these problems that in, in three months. So you had to, co- you had to combine all the, all the tools that we had. But I was still at that point, I mean, fixing thing, yes, but not really thinking as much about America. Because America, to me, was America of crossing over from Jimmy Carter to Ronald Reagan without much depth into it other than history courses and so forth was, was that it had been bad and it was getting better <laughs> and that, you know, supply side, all these things that were talked about, you know, I, I just at a superficial level, not at a level how does all this stuff affect the regular folks because I'm, I'm at that point in my life, I've come from really nothing, but now I'm on a Learjet once in a while. I'm in first class flying. I'm not detached from everybody, but I'm so busy that I don't really see America, and I don't, I don't travel. I fly over America. And flying over America is a difficult thing because you don't, you know, when you're up, up there, everything looks okay down below. I mean, it might be cloudy, you don't see it, but when you look down and you're flying over Youngstown, Ohio, it looks okay from the air. And that's where our politicians are today. They're, they're, they're flying over the country. They're from San Francisco on the coast to Washington, D.C. They're from Washington, D.C. somehow to Beijing. They don't see what's happened. And as I got out of Morgan Keegan, I was able to leave by the grace of God at the right time, the peak of the market, and uh, I really didn't know what I was going to do. I was supposed to start a hedge fund. That's what, I'd run a lot of money. I, this is the way to make more money. And I ended up, at a, ended up at a Christian camp, and it just put it on my heart. My buddies I was with, that, that that's not what I should be doing. There were other things to fix, and I had to go back to my roots. And my roots were... Cranston, Rhode Island. And so that's where I headed. And I remember, I remember sitting there, and I didn't know what I was going to fix. I didn't know what problems we were going to have. I really didn't have any problems then. I was, I was doing okay. Had three kids at the time. And I just felt this strong pull to go back to my hometown, a town that I hadn't really effectively been there for 20 years. And I talked to my wife who we were up in Vermont. I was going to live in Vermont. I didn't know anything about Colorado. I just knew Vermont as, as sort of a rural place where there weren't a lot of problems and you can raise your children. And uh, that's what I was sort of looking at doing, not getting involved in fixing anything else. It, we'd fixed the firm. We'd, we'd sold it at a good price. And I could do something else to make boatload money because my experience was looking at these situations like a hedge fund in stocks. That was my experience. That's what I had done well. But instead, I headed to Cranston, Rhode Island, bought a small home. My wife loved it crossed the street diagonally from one of my great childhood friends that my wife knew the wife of, the only person she knew in Cranston. She's from Mississippi. And I said, hey, we're going back to Cranston. And she said, okay. I don't know why she said okay, because I didn't know why I was going back. And we're going to take a short break, and I'm going to tell you, 
what really happened in Cranston and how that led very directly to me coming here to Colorado, starting up this show, and starting to reawaken America, I hope that we are not alone, that we can band together, that these problems are not insurmountable, that we're going to have to stop saying someone else can handle the problem, which is what I've been saying for a couple of years. Can't do it anymore. Won't do it. This is Steve Laffey's Fixing America. We'll be right back in a couple of minutes. Stay tuned. Steve Laffey's Fixing America returns after these commercial messages. Why does our government continue to spend more than it takes in? Why has balancing the budget become a completely foreign concept in Washington? While Americans sacrifice, work three jobs, take less vacations, and hold on to the old clunker in the driveway for one more year, Washington just keeps spending and borrowing to pay for it. If it doesn't work at your house, how can it possibly continue to work in the USA? Laffey can balance the budget on the back of a napkin. Tune in tomorrow at 3 to learn how. Only on Steve Laffey's Fixing America. Serve. It has no sound, yet I have heard it in the whispered retelling of honorable sacrifices made by those who have served before me. The call to serve has no form, yet I have clearly seen it in the eyes of men and women infinitely more courageous and more driven than most. The call to serve has no weight, yet I have held it in my hands. I will commit to carry it close to my heart until my country is safe and the anguish of those less fortunate has been soothed. The call to serve is at once invisible and always present. And for those who choose to answer the call, for their country, for their fellow man, for themselves, it is the most powerful force on earth. America's Navy, a global force for good. in almost every school bus and classroom. I go to school with your children. We say the Pledge of Allegiance together. You see me around the neighborhood and you tell me that I'm a pretty good kid. Well, I'm one out of every five children in America and I'm struggling with hunger. This problem is closer than you think. My teacher tells me we can grow up to be whatever we want. I want to grow up to be someone who doesn't go to bed hungry. There's enough food in this country to feed everybody. Please visit feedingamerica.org today and find your local food bank for ways to help. Every dollar you donate helps provide eight meals for kids like me, quietly struggling with hunger. Together, we are Feeding America. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Well, I finally did it. I opened a 401k. What? Why? Just wait for the inheritance. We've definitely got a rich uncle somewhere. We're one call away from the winner's circle at the Derby, dinners with multiple forks, a vacation home in the country, using summer as a verb. You don't actually think that, do you? When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs, the Rhode Island Society of CPAs, and the Ad Council. And now, back to the Fixing America radio program with your host, Steve Laffey. So Steve Laffey is the mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island. He's challenging Senator Lincoln Chafee in the Republican primary this September 12th, just two and a half weeks from now. Let me ask you, Mr. Laffey, can you, be, can you win the general election or only the primary? What are you hoping for here? No, I'm not just here for the divisional playoffs, Chris. I'm here to win the whole thing. When I was a kid, they told me I'd never go to college. They tell me I went to Howard Business School. Our family didn't have any money. They told me I'd never run a southern-based brokerage firm because I was educated in the north. And they told me I'd never be the mayor. So just keep telling me I can't do things. But we're here to play for all the marbles. <laughs> well, we are here to play for all the marbles. That was uh, myself on Chris Matthews. We were talking... Um, Oh, that must have been two weeks before the, the 2006 election. And uh, it was one of those situations where Chris had me on, and you can't hit the clip at the end of it, but I, I went through this, all these solutions with him. Boom, boom, boom. And, and he's, a, I, guess a big, I guess, a big liberal. I guess a big Democrat. And at the end, he's like, I like this. These are like regular solutions. This is okay. And he got on the phone with me afterwards, and he said, I don't know if you can win this thing, which, which I did not. 
But, uh, but at least you got some solutions. And because, uh, you know, he probably gets sick of hearing this whole thing every day, too, where he asks people questions and they don't get any answers. Um, but we were talking. Anyway, Steve Laffey, Steve Laffey's Fixing America. We're back. Remember, it's with LaffeyRadio.com. This is the inaugural show. This is the, probably the one show we won't have a specific solution like tomorrow about bouncing the budget. Uh, you know, on Thursday, I think we're talking about China and our trade relationships and what to do about that, that disaster that's, that's emerged since 2001, really, but for a long time, but especially since 2001. You know, like us on Facebook. We're Laffey Radio on Facebook. We've got uh, different products on the, on the web page. We want you to share them with other people, too. The Laffey Minutes is going to start coming out tomorrow. You know, if you like it, share it with your friends. You know, it's going to be things that you're thinking that people aren't really saying. The Laffey Buzz is going to be a daily bro- blog. So go to Laffey Radio. You know, turn on, turn on the show. And if you can't catch it live tomorrow at 1 o'clock, uh, turn it on at 2 o'clock. Turn it on at 3 o'clock. It's going to play every hour. It's going to be archived. Uh, there's going to be a lot of transparency here. So we've got a lot of things to talk about. And we've got to get you involved. This is the, the point of the show is not me just spouting off stuff. We've got to get people involved. You know, we're going to be set up to be taking phone calls. And we're, we're, all these things are going to happen. But, uh, you know, I wanted to turn up, you know, in this particular show for people who don't know me and people who even do know me. You know, how did I get to be sitting here spending all this money getting a command center in Fort Collins to be able to broadcast? Well, one, technology has changed dramatically that we can actually do this now. And, uh, and I'm happy for that. You know, I got quality people around me with Scott and Sean who helped out. We got other people going to help out. We, we need other people to help out. We got to get this thing. We're going to take this thing on the road at some point. But for now, we've got to build up a base of knowledge for our, for our viewers because my frustration is, has been a great deal that we're not getting serious news from well, our serious news channels. We're not getting it from serious radio. We're not getting solutions to problems. And this is where I really come back into the story where, where I've come back to Cranston, Rhode Island, and I don't know what I'm doing in Cranston, Rhode Island. And part of me really doesn't want to be there. My, my childhood, except for my friends, I mean, it wasn't the greatest growing up. It, it, for a lot of people, you have these great memories of your childhood. I don't have the greatest. I have some really good ones, especially the ones across the street with, you know, the, the Bennett family that helped raise me and the public schools and so forth. So I'm back home, and people are t- asking people what I should be doing. And, of course, it turns to politics, even though I had never really been in politics. And then, lo and behold... It's a situation where I'm, I, I look in the, the, in the newspaper article where Cranston, my hometown, is missing millions of dollars. It's really not missing. It hasn't stolen, but it's, it's, it's in the Cranston Herald. And I, I head over to City Hall to just say, what do you, what's going on here? I look for an audit. And for all you who don't know what an audit is, it's just a measure of the books. It's, just, it's a large book that says how much revenue, how much income the city took in and how much they ex- ex- spent. And in the p- private sector, which I was totally used to, you know, IBM can put out after 28 days, a multi, multi-billion dollar corporation after 28 days puts out its quarterly earnings. And if they didn't put them out on time, stock price would just implode. But Cranston hadn't done one in effectively three years. And I'm looking at the city clerk or the lady there in, in City Hall. I'm like, well, that's totally illegal. What do you mean three years? And then I knew. I knew the city was going to go broke. And I would have to fix it. I knew right then. I picked up a cell phone. It, would, it was not a smartphone. My wife was in Memphis, Tennessee, even though we had, we'd come back to Cranston. We still owned a home in, in Memphis. And I just picked up the phone, and I, I, looked at, I looked at it. I called her and said, honey, I, I, think, I think this is my, my, uh, my calling. I've got to uh, fix this city. It's, I don't think the city people in the city even know as badly as I know now that the whole thing's going to go broke. And it does. And I run. And I don't even announce until the following way. This is October 2001, maybe December. And along the way... I learn all about people. I mean, I learn about politics at the rawest level. I mean, Cranston, Rhode Island, and Rhode Island is probably the most corrupt state. In fact, the New York Times had an article about Rhode Island being the most corrupt place, New Orleans being second, and I think it was Chicago being third. So it's based on how many people go to jail who are elected officials and, and, and so forth, and fines and so forth. And I, and, and I didn't know that at all. I, just, I didn't know anything about this stuff. I just figured people like in the private sector, we would get this thing done. And the city was trying to do everything they could. All members of the city council and the mayor doing everything they could to destroy it. And I'd be sitting there at the city council meeting. This would be in January, in February of 2002. I'm not even a candidate. I haven't announced. And I'm looking at it going, what do you mean you're going to issue a pub? I, I get up in public. I go, what do you mean you're going to issue a public obligation bond? Which is how they thought they would solve their problem by taking all this debt of a city that had, you know, $18 million in a pension plan and $250 million in liabilities. 
Yeah, let me repeat that just so because people listening are like, what? $18 million in a pension plan and $250 million of liability. It's like a 3% funding ratio. They would, by the way, decide to take all $18 million out of the, pen, out of the pension plan to balance the budget in May, May 15th of 2002. And I'd be up there saying to them, well, this is a wonderful plan if the world ends in like three months. But if it does it, now finally those rating agencies will pay attention because rating agencies like Moody's and so forth, they're slow. They look, they look backwards. They look backwards several years because things usually move slowly in cities and, and countries and states. And that's, so they're used to it. In this particular case, it, it was moving fast, moving fast toward bankruptcy. And so we had a giant problem in the hands, which, which I kind of love because I love giant problems. I love giant financial problems. And this is all in a microcosm of America because one of the things that was happening, and this may be the biggest problem, the financial problem was over here. The people problem was over here. And the thought process was, if everybody just thinks that they can't do anything about it, how are we going to fix it? And this is how we get to the show. If everybody out there thinks, we really can't do much about it, I mean, what am I going to do? This is what people in Cranston were thinking in 2002. Because they, they kind of knew after I came home and after the, the audit was three years late and I started promoting all these different ideas, like stopping the pension obligation bond, which, by the way, stopped. Luckily, these people had no clue what they were doing in some respects because you could stop these things before they got issued. And even talking about the issues and campaigning, when I started campaigning every day and knocking on doors and giving people solutions and, and having to tell people what sort of the message in a macro world that America needs today. In order to fix this, it's really going to hurt. Like, like nobody will like this. That was sort of my campaign message. Uh, but it has to be done now. I didn't move all the way back here. I'd bring my children, my wife's from Mississippi, to live in Detroit. And that was sort of the campaign message. And people would be like, that's not much of a campaign message. You've got to give these people, well, they didn't say hope and change then, I suppose, but you've got to give them something that smile all the time. You've got to kiss all the babies. And, I, and while I kissed a lot of babies, I, I was like, no. I was like, this is a big, big problem. And so we've got to focus on, like, what's, what's, how do we fix this like, right now? So I, so I become the mayor of Cranston. And, it's a, and it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's a really a wonderful thing to be the mayor of Cranston in my hometown. You know, you grow up there, you know, the, you actually know the mayors. And in, in the Northeast, you really get, to, you actually know far more than you see out here in the, in the, in the West, your elected officials. They seem to, they seem to, because they're smaller cities and they seem to be there. So I knew the mayor when I was in high school. I didn't know him. I, mean, I met him. I was the president of student council. He came to the meeting. Uh, there was a disruption at the meeting one time and he put his arm around me afterwards and he said, this is always happens. Don't worry about it. I remember stuff like that. Uh, I remember in junior high school, no one uh, meeting the mayor. So I knew this was an, kind of an important thing. And I knew the city that I grew up in was sort of at a, at a turning point. It could either turn into Detroit and just keep going, or we could arrest it and stop it. And the question was, was anybody really going to focus on it? And, and that's the thing about that. We talk about the financial problem in a second. But the other problem was, how do we get people out? I mean, how do we get them to know that they can make a difference? Because if it's just me, if it's just me, we aren't going to make a difference. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I can win the election. And we did. We won against a very tough old wily uh, uh, career politician who had run with lots of money and we weren't supposed to win, but because people were focused and that's, that's really the issue that we're missing in America because people would start to focus, they knew it was near the end and they kind of wondered what, what did bankruptcy mean? Like, could we get a, could, people were talking about, could you get a mortgage in a city that, that went bankrupt? And of course, in Rhode Island, you can't really declare bankruptcy like some of the cities you've seen since then. Now, Cranston, by the way, this is back in 2002. It was 1992 when Bridgeport, Connecticut went bankrupt. It was 2002 until the next city just about went bankrupt. This was, this was Cranston, Rhode Island. So, but we were able to, through hook or by crook, I mean, when I was the mayor, for example, when I became the mayor, uh, we had things called budget barnstorming where I'd just be showing up on street corners with a chair and coffee shops telling people about my budget, why it should pass, which, of course, included raising taxes and cutting services. You know, and I tried to make it as even as I could. I tried to even it out because it couldn't be one way or the other. And we didn't print money like the U.S. government does. Um, and we weren't on the gold standard, you know, where things were flowing out. But, but businesses were going to fly out. And, and so I become mayor. And the city had just gone to the lowest bond rating in America. It's borrowing three-month money at triple tax equivalent rates of 15%. And I have to walk around, and this is in, in Rhode Island where maybe everybody gets a joke and say, this is sort of like you've lost five straight football games and a guy named Vinny with a baseball bat shows up. This is, this is, this is usury rates. Nobody borrows like this. And so we, we were about to default. 
And so we had to take care of the short-term problems, and luckily the people started really getting involved. In fact, even when they came when they were angry, we had to raise taxes in January, my first week of being a mayor. Nine zero vote of the city council to do so, putting a supplemental tax. And that was just basically get the cash flow back into the city. And people were screaming, but at least they were there. You know, picture a room in a city with this 1,200 people um, in, 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 a, in, a, uh, in a room that holds 800 at a city council. I mean, it usually has like, I don't know, six people. You know, the same six people that come every meeting, right? If you've been to one of these once in a while because you've been there probably for a little league or, or something else at a city council meeting. So we got to the root of the problem, and that was get the cash back in and then start cutting everything we could. And then there had to be some symbolic things too, even though they were about, you know, not as much money, and it was about the crossing guards. There were these crossing guards that made $129 an hour, and I really didn't know about them. Yeah, I'm sorry. There were these crossing guards. I have to stop this every time because people listening have, are like, he must have misspoke. No, there were these crossing guards that made $129 an hour. And they got free health insurance for their entire family. They're represented by the International Laborers Union. Most of their leaders lived in Cranston. Uh, there were 39 crossing guards across the city, nearly a million dollars. And I remember trying to real, uh, you know, talk to their union heads, talk to them. Hey, listen, you can't get free health insurance for working, working an hour a day, five days a week, 180 hours a year. I mean, I was on the campaign trail. People are crying, even back then, crying about the, not having any health insurance. How are they going to pay the taxes? And of course, they wouldn't listen. We had to fire them. We went through a multi-year lawsuit. And that is another thing that I learned about fixing things. At some point at the heart of, heart of this matter was an attitude. There was an attitude in Cranston that, that was simply wrong, that people could get away with this. And so instead of fighting it, we'll go along with it. And so the legitimacy of the whole government was in question. And I see that on a macro sense today, but the way to get at it was to go right at the root and explain to people that, that we could not have this in our city. And while they were wonderful ladies, and even the lady who crossed me, who crossed me, um, she was a great lady, but we had to stop, you know, we had to stop the situation. We fought for years and we won. So there were big problems like right away. There were little problems, but all along we were fixing it. And, and lo and behold, when you woke up, oh, I don't know, Year, three, year, three years later, the city had a massive surplus. The, the pension fund went from $9 million, which, remember, 18 down to 9 and then back up to 50 The city was run right. And then became the real problem in Cranston. People stopped showing up. They thought everything was fixed, and they thought I had done it. Like, you may be watching the show thinking that I'm going to do this. No, they did it. And, and, and I went to one of these uh, meetings. Um, it was about the school committee taking the health insurance co-pays down they're going to pay less and i told the school committee hey we got to get people uh, give it three or four days so i can get some people out here to, to you know to, to hear about it and they wouldn't do it and people said oh laffy will take care of this but i didn't they weren't there they weren't there to change the votes all this stuff was on public opinion all this stuff was on people showing up and that's what we're going to need in america today along the way you know i ran for the u.s senate and uh, in fact we have a clip of me running for the u.s senate uh, boss when we play clip five I mean, this is me starting to run for the United States Senate. This is one of the ads we ran. Uh, and, and let's just play that and we'll get back to running for the U.S. Senate. Washington is... Washington is going in the wrong direction. Runaway wasteful spending, out of control borders, record high gas prices. It's time for a change. I'm Steve Laffey. This is my wife, Kelly, and I approve this message. We can cut government waste and lower taxes. We can stop our dependence on foreign oil and win the war on terror. And we can secure our borders. But first, we have to change Washington. If you agree, I'd respectfully ask for your vote. And that's it. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the ad of, of me realizing that the nation then, this is what I've been focused on since then, that the nation was in the same situation as Cranston, Rhode Island. It was farther out. There's far more ways to tax people. They can print money. They can, we can go on all day about the things that America can do because of, of all the goodwill and the money and the assets and so forth that we built up, plus the fact that the rest of the world isn't doing so great either. So, but I knew then, I, I, I knew that's why I ran for the U.S. Senate. I knew that it needed to be fixed. And we didn't win the race since it's a long story. In fact, we can play it. We can play the opposite clip. This is, this is what I began to learn about, about my own party. I, I remain, I guess, according to Craig Shirley, as the only Republican, I ran in a Republican primary. So in a primary, um, I remained the only re elected Republican to be attacked by the National Republican Party 
not just to defend now Democrat Lincoln Chafer, forget about the money wasted on that, but they saw where I was coming from. It was, it was a situation, I think, where they saw this guy's not going to play ball when he gets down here. He really does want to balance the budget. This is what he's talking about. He's probably not going to change his mind. I mean, a lot of people go to Washington, they change their mind. We've seen this over and over and over again. And so let's play the clip four, boss. This is the Re Republican National Committee trying to make sure that I don't get to help fix America. It's time to play politics as usual at Mayor Steve Laffey's office. Corporate executives get a no-bid pilot project contract for automated speed enforcement. Then they funnel thousands of dollars in contributions to Laffey's campaign. And for working families, Steve Laffey's reward, three property tax rate increases, taxes skyrocket. One increase of nearly $500 per homeowner. Steve Laffey's game of politics as usual. Yeah, by the way, none of that stuff in that ad is true. There was no no, there was no, no bid contract that some guy got. You know, there was a $10 deal that some guy could test something in the city, but that didn't matter to them. And it, it was totally, and I really went through the ringer on that. I knew, I knew that, that uh, none of this stuff was true, and I kept fighting through it, but I didn't have a medium to fight through. I had the local paper to fight through. It wasn't, it wasn't very effective. And while we did a great job, we lost. And, and then I had to decide what to do next. And that's the part of the last segment we're going to come up. We're going to take a quick break here. We're going to get into exactly what happened, the book, the movie, and now Steve Laffey's Fixing America, which is now, I think, the culmination of all these things I've learned and that we've got to band together, much like we did in Cranston, to help fix this great country. Steve Laffey's Fixing America. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Steve Laffey's Fixing America returns after these commercial messages. When I have an asthma attack, I feel scared. It's like tiny nails in the air poke my lungs. I start to cough. Sometimes I, my Steve parents Lappy. have to take me to the hospital. Today, one out of 13 children suffer from some form of asthma, accounting for nearly one-third of all emergency room visits. I feel like I'm choking. It's kind of like an elephant is on my chest. A little whistle of sound comes out when I breathe. But while your child may suffer from asthma, asthma doesn't have to make your child suffer. There are simple ways you can prevent your child's next attack. To learn more, log on to www.noattacks.org or call your doctor. Because even one attack is one too many. I feel like a fish with no water. Brought to you by the EPA, the Ad Council, and this station. I am an American soldier. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of the United States and live the Army values. I will always place this first. I will never accept defeat. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined. I am disciplined. Physically and mentally tough. Trained and proficient in my warrior tasks and drills. I'm an expert and I'm a professional. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the, the enemies of the United States of America in close combat. I am a guardian of freedom and the American way of life. American soldier. I am an American soldier. I am an American soldier. They're strong, and there's Army strong. See what it takes at GoArmy.com. Picture this. Your next trip, Utah. Five national parks. First, Zion. You're walking. The ground rises. The ground drops. The ground becomes water. Next, Bryce. You're riding a mule. You're riding a mule under giant orange drip castles. You are not dreaming. You will not forget this. On to Capitol Reef. Take the scenic route. The really scenic route. Take a path you've never taken and see the stars for the first time. Now for Canyon Lands. You're riding a bike. You're riding a bike on Mars. Now you're riding the rapids. Class 2, Class 3, Class 4. Classic. Arches, 5.32 a.m. Some things are worth racing the sunrise for. The horizon lightens. You round the corner. Whoa. This is Life Elevated. The Mighty Five. Five iconic parks, one epic experience. Plan your trip at visitutah.com. And now, 
back to the Fixing America radio program with your host, Steve Laffey. Why does our government continue to spend more than it takes in? Why has balancing the budget become a completely foreign concept in Washington? While Americans sacrifice, work three jobs, take less vacations, and hold on to the old clunker in the driveway for one more year, Washington just keeps spending and borrowing to pay for it. If it doesn't work at your house, how can it possibly continue to work in the USA? Laffey can balance the budget on the back of a napkin. Tune in tomorrow at 3 to learn how. Only on Steve Laffey's Fixing America. with the outspoken former Cranston Mayor Stephen Laffey in Newport. Just one of his many stops across America, he says, to film his new documentary movie called Fixing America. The last uh, six months, I just haven't been able to sleep. I don't think America has much time. Laffey says he and his production crew are traveling back roads in a giant RV to get real stories. To travel the back roads and show the contrast between what really goes on in America and Kansas and Stuttgart, Arkansas and Youngstown, Ohio, which is burned out. You don't live here anymore. You've come back. What do you see happening in Rhode Island right now? It's sad. It's, it's, it's worse. And that's uh, it's 2011 clip from me making the movie Fixing America, which I got right here. If you haven't gotten it, you can go get it. It's on the website also, LaffeyRadio.com. And uh, we're on Facebook. Like us on Facebook, Laffy Radio on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Twitter, Laffy Radio also. It's not too hard to remember. Laffy Radio, Laffy Radio, Laffy Radio. So, so that movie and that clip of that movie was me back in Rhode Island to film part of the movie Fixing America. And uh, I think we better back, back up to how we got there. You know, when I, when I lost the, the Senate race, I'd immediately thought that there was a great story to be told. And I called up Penguin Books and I called the senior editor up there, Bernard Etten, and she liked the idea. And we wrote a book called How the Washington Republican Establishment Lost Everything in 2006 called Primary Mistake, basically my primary, the National Republican Party's mistake. And I'd learned a lot through this race, but not as much as I would learn in 2008 in traveling the country. See, then in 2008, I thought I'd run for governor of Rhode Island and, and Rhode Island's such a small state. And if you become the governor now, you really don't leave. It's, uh, it's uh, wonderfully parochial. You know, everybody stays and, and everybody, no one travels that far. And in fact, when I got to be older, you know, having grown up in Rhode Island, I'd, I'd be down in uh, Memphis and people would drive like seven hours over the weekend. I'd be like seven hours. I mean, I'm, 20 minutes is a long time for me, just mentally to, to drive on a car. I've kind of broken out of that mold being in Colorado. But, uh, but in 2008, I, I, I told my wife, we've got to see the country. We've got to get in a car because if I become the governor, of Rhode Island, and hypothetically, if I were to win and be the governor for eight years, I mean, the kids would grow up and never see Mount Rushmore. They'd never see uh, uh, these national parks. They'd, they'd, never, they'd never do certain things. So we put five kids in a car. One was three months old. And by the way, three-month-old baby in a car, whenever you get like 10 miles from where you're going to go, you all know this, people who have families, the baby stops crying and you're trying to make the extra miles that day. And we drove for three and a half months, I think, from Rhode Island out to, to Oregon, uh, Seattle with some friends up in Montana, then back and then up and then down. And then at one point, I'm in the Natchez Trace National Park. We'd left uh, uh, Mississippi. And I had this feeling that we should not go down to the to Key West, to the, to the National Park that was the lowest, uh, the sh- most southernmost national park. So my wife's looking at me finally. She's about to lose it, you know, because it's been, we traveled the whole country with no reservations in 2008 when this recession is going on. And we finally, we go back up north and we go back down. We don't go there and so forth. So we keep changing where we're going. But that's when I really saw America in a car in Buffalo, Wyoming at a Motel 6, hanging with people outside Glacier Park, eating Brazzleberry pie from all over the country um, in Wisconsin, pulling over on the side of a road to get gas and finding out that the owner, after eating some pizza, the gas station had pizza, and we were hungry, and then showing us that they had a little petting zoo in the back for the for themselves. And so we went back there, and just and just and, and going into the Lansing, Michigan, into the state capitol, having the guys who run that capitol show me around when the place was closed. I mean, it was it was a remarkable, remarkable time, and it really got me focused on on Americans and how different they are from what the elected officials think, and how they the, the Americans, us the Americans, we the Americans. We know there's a problem. We just don't know what to do about it. And that's how I came to leave Rhode Island. I got back and 
I said, we're not going to fix this place right now. And I'm not going to bring my children up here. And I got in a car and drove to Fort Collins, Colorado. And I spent the last several years just raising my children, homeschooling my children, teaching my children, and along with my wife, who does most of the work. And while I was here, I still couldn't sleep. And that's how this idea of fixing America came about. It came about simply because some, some great guys invited me out. They wanted me to look at another situation they had, uh, another radio uh, concept. And uh, they happened to be at Sundance Film Festival. And I flew out there and being interviewed uh, by Scott Hogg and Barry Hinckley on a radio st- show, sitting next to a guy who made the movie Margin Call, which is a great movie. I just got it on my heart. We need a movie. All this traveling I've done now, all the months I've spent, these people, and that's why the cover of this movie is just like regular people. It's people that I remember that burned into my heart, like Viola, Larry Sugar Boy Walker. I mean, the list goes on here. And, and so that's why I called up a, my buddy who had a production company, the only guy I really knew, and said, I'm making this movie. And he said, I'm in for half the action. That's how Fixing America, the movie, came about. And it's been playing around, and you can go get it on Amazon, and that's not the point of the show, but you should go get it. You should watch it. It's a heartfelt movie about how regular folks know there's a giant problem and they all want to fix it and they'll all help. They'll all put in, you know, like the lady at the wishing well, they're all putting two pence if that's all they've got. The millionaires will put in more than the, than, the, than the poorer people, but they'll do it as long as it's fair. And that's what's missing in America. It's not fair. They don't think it's fair. We don't think it's fair. No one's getting to the solutions. It's just one giant argument going on. How about the shutdown argument and the debt ceiling argument? It's a TV show. And they know it. And they're tuning out. They're tuning out. I mean, I listen, go work out at the local workout place and see how many people are actually watching the TV screen. People are bringing in things. And now, by the way, you can bring in your iPhone, go to the LaffeyRadio.com, and you can just watch the show while you're working out. You can watch it sideways in full screen. You, you, you can watch it. You don't have to watch what's on TV. You don't have to watch. There's a, today, there's a guy named Chris Brown. I really don't remember who he is, but I guess he's assaulted like the seventh person. That's like the news. It's a half hour on CNN today, but it's really not the news. The news is the growth in China in their military power taken by getting extra cash from us and keeping the currency on theirs low, continue to buy our U.S. Treasury so we think we're on the hock to them, and all of it ending very badly over the next several years. That's the news. That's what we got to talk about. That's what we got to get our elected officials to focus in. That's who we got to elect to office. The news is Russia's resurgence because of our terrible foreign policy or lack thereof of any foreign policy where they're taking care of. We're letting Russia, we're letting Putin be in charge of taking care of chemical weapons in another country when we're the world superpower? How did that come to be? So when I came back from this trip in 08, it had really changed me more than, I say, not anything. The death of my best friend at 11 was, was a life-changing event. His, my divorce was a terrible event years ago. But this was a life-changing event where I, I just couldn't. I just couldn't run for, for office right then. And along the way, I've been thinking of ways to help fix America. But then I, I, I actually wanted to help focus on my children. And I did, and I did. I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I took so. I mean, I, I, listen, I'm very blessed. I'm blessed to even set up a studio like this. I mean, this is a, this is a real studio with real guests will be sitting here. It costs real money. And I don't know what's going to happen with this show. I don't know where it's going to lead. But I do know this, that the regular folks of America, the people I saw on the road making Fixing America, the movie, the people I saw in 2000, the people I see today, because if you don't know me, this is what I do. I stop just about everybody and talk to them and say, how you doing, and what's going on, and ask them questions, and, and so forth. I mean, people I sell hay to have now become my friends. I have this ranch out here, we sell hay, and you know, I, I, I sell hay to people that become my friends. I found out what's going on in their life, and, 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 and talk to them about it. And so I know what's important to them, and I know getting at these solutions, but I also know that people haven't spent their life like me. They haven't spent their life studying all these financial problems, going through newspaper after newspaper every day for 30 some odd years, m- knowing some of the people in Washington, been through the ringer and running for office, helping run in a, in a large way, a, a, a big, relatively big financial firm, you know, the sort of the Merrill Lynch of the South. Um, you know, being involved in, a, in, a, in, in probably the worst financial situation in municipal history before Stockton, California, before Detroit, up, in, up until say 2005. And then over, and then seeing through probably the most rapid turnaround in, in municipal history where the bond rating went up by eight notches in three and a half years. That never happens. And so learning how to get to the crux of the problem, 
is what I'm good at. And I want to get to the crux of the problem, but I want to give them to you. And I want you to send them to other people. You know, we've got a, a right now, not right now after the show's over, we've got a Fixing America Presents. It's a new one about banks. Watch it. It's like, a, it's like two and a half minutes. You'll get the message. The banks are simply too big. They, they will not be efficient over time. They are very inefficient. Look at JP Morgan. Look at JP, paying out a third of its net income over the last two years, 12 to 20% over the last five years in fines and penalties and still lacking in this country the legitimacy because we're lacking the criminal convictions. We're lacking the, 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 in the banking se- sector. So we're going to get at that. But we all know banks should be smaller. And listen, we can get into other solutions. And that's going to be part of this show. People are going to come on here and I'm going to, I'm going to, in fact, we got one person we already think is going to come on in the next several weeks. But they're not going to come on and talk about their show or how to promote something. I'm going to, I don't know everything. And so part of the show is you, you watching me take out one of these yellow notepads and sit here while you sit here saying, huh, really? Okay. So how do we do that again? How does that make sense? Questioning people to find different solutions for our healthcare problems. Different solutions for um, our financial problems. When are we actually going to get a candidate or a person or a leader to take on Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and our national defense? We talk about everything else but those things. But that's the most amount of money. How we, are we only going to wake up when interest rates rise? It can't be that way. I mean, it might be that way. We might be heading into that right now, but we can't. And so I am a serial fixer, if that's, if that's okay to say. And so I, I believe I know how to fix this country. And I believe there's still a lot to learn. I mean, know some of the stuff. But we've all got to participate. And you listening at home, you've got to start to participate. It can't be like it was before I came home in Cranston, Rhode Island, where people said somebody else will take care of that. There's a great scene in Fixing America, the movie. And it's a guy named Jeff. And you can get this at Amazon, Fixing America. You can just go to our website. There'll be a link for it. You go to fixingamericamovie.com. But there's, there's, there's many scenes that are memorable to me. There's, we're in, a, just left Cincinnati, Ohio. We're heading north. We go down a side street, literally a side street by the water because Jeff, uh, our director of photography, who's a d- genius, he's got these 20 ideas that he wants to do that day. So we're going down the side street and a man's walking at us and he's got this hair coming down like this and he's got a baseball cap on. And we pull over. This is how we made the movie. Pull over and say, hey, can we talk to you? I'm Steve Laffey. I'm a serious guy, blah, 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 blah. Um, we got to talk to you about fixing America. What are your thoughts? And we talked to him for a long time. And of course, there's, I think there's one scene that makes it into the movie, which is hard to edit a movie and take out some of these great scenes. But at one point he says, and, I, and I'm paraphrasing and, and use, try to use his accent, but Republican, Democrat, ain't nobody care about that. We just want to do the freaking job we put him in there to do. And he's saying, like, I don't, I don't, I shouldn't have to show up. I mean, we, we put these people in office, the city council, at the, at the state rep, at the governor's level, in the state, at the federal level, but it's Congress, but we put them in to do the job. Just go do the job you're elected to do. But they don't. And so we can't just leave it at that point where Jeff left it. You know? We can leave it at ain't nobody care about the Democrat Republican thing, and it looks like, like nobody cares about that. That we need something new, it looks like. But we can't leave it at, we're just going to let them do the job. We, we, we've got to take action. I mean, we need a million people to march to Washington and stay until we change something. Not just stay. You know, this is Steve Laffey. This has been, I mean, the hour's about up. Tomorrow, we are going to fix the U.S. budget in an hour. It can be done. I've done it before. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it with your help later on. We'll get you to participate. But we're, we're, this week's going to be a wide-sweeping... You know, overlook at some of the great problems with specific solutions. How much money do we take out of Social Security? And we'll go on all this week, and then next week we'll get much more specific. Every day, we're going to be broadcasting from Colorado. Like us on Facebook, Laffy Radio. Go to the website. Share it right now with somebody. Say, watch this. You know, watch this tomorrow. Watch, watch one of our Fixing America Presents. But this is Steve Laffy. We're signing off until tomorrow. To, to, until tomorrow. We'll be back at LaffyRadio.com. God bless you. God bless America. Together, we will fix it.
You've been listening to Steve Laffey's Fixing America radio program on the Laffey Radio Network. Fixing America is broadcast Monday through Friday afternoons at 3 p.m. right here at www.laffyradio.com. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or account of this broadcast without the express written consent of Laffey Network, LLC is prohibited.